The Poe Politicking Show is brought to you by Audible. With over 180,000 titles to choose from, Audible is great for any continuous learner wanting to grow and expand their knowledge and insight. Go to www.audibletrial.com slash PO Audio and get an audio book of your choice free with a 30-day trial. After the trial, your paid membership will begin at $14.95 per month. With your membership, you will receive one credit every month, good for an audiobook on Audible. Cancel before your trial ends and you will not be charged. So go to www.audibletrial.com slash PO Audio and download a free book by Tony Robbins, Grant Cardone, Napoleon Hill, Les Brown, Damon John, and more. Always remember that knowledge is power. Popolitikin.com. You are now politicking with Pope on Popolitikin.com. I don't know how y'all see it, but when it comes to the children, Wu Tang is for the children. We teach the children. You know what I mean? Yeah, one, two, one, two. When I say it's the world famous DJ Brad. And you live on Pope Politicking, man. And we doing it real big from the A-Town to your town. You know what it is.
The Legion of Doom has taken over. Welcome back to PolPolitikin.com, your home for self-help meets hip-hop. Make sure you subscribe to our podcast, like, share, subscribe to this interview. Now I'll politic with my homie DJ Brad. How you doing, bro? And I'm good, man. It's a pleasure to be on here with you, Doc. Yeah, thanks, man. So you can talk about your hometown. Let us know where you're from. Man, I'm from Rome, Georgia originally, but I'm residing in Atlanta for like 20 years. You know, so Atlanta my home, but Rome, Georgia my home, too. So how can you talk about your background? Because I was reading you started in the in the early, late nineties, mid nineties. Yeah, um, uh, you know I'm from a, it's a country town, so you know basically we we grew up on on just whoever we was close to around. That was you had a lot of local rappers, but not that many. But you know that's kind of where I learned my craft from. You know, um, we had a few cats from my neighborhood that was. Uh, Called itself the Backyard Poets, and it kind of gave me my first, my first uh, dose of hip hop. And once I got a hold to it, you know, it, I just took it to the next level. You know, it was I was all I wanted. I was obsessed with the music. Yeah, what was, was your first? What, what was your first dose of hip hop? Um, let's see. It was probably was like um, uh, far as like rap, rap. It was like um. Raising Hell, Run DMC. But, you know, by where we were at, you know, I had a lot of, uh, we listened to a lot of booty shaking music, like Two Live Crew. And there was some techno stuff like craft work. I don't know if you remember this song called um, Boing, Boom Chunk, Boing. That, that was like the, the hottest, that was like one of the hottest records in the neighborhood, man. Like everybody had to take. Like, you wasn't nobody if you didn't have that boing, boom, chuck. <laughs> boing, then the beat come in, and like, it was, nope, we was break dancing, and, and, you know what I'm saying? So, and, um, uh, what was that other group? Art of Noise. And it was the Art of Noise, craft work, and um, pretty much Run DMC, that was it. That's all we had up there. And then later on, we got this group called... Uh, Herschel Wood Hardheads, which was uh, Lil Kiki the Don. Somebody brought that. Somebody went to Texas for the summer and came back with the tape. And, you know, we, we had, like, dual cassettes. So we was, everybody was getting copies of that um, Lil Kiki the Don tape. So it kind of just, that's we was influenced heavily by Texas in my town. I don't know how that happened, but it mainly because of just people that were moving there from Texas, and they had their own dose of what they were listening to out there. Mm-hmm. We didn't really get much New York stuff, like Run DMC, Beastie Boys, Fat Boys. That was pretty much it. And then how would you define a DJ? What is a DJ to you? A DJ, man, you want me to get deep, <laughs> don't you? <laughs> I mean, you know, a DJ is, is way more than just it's playing music. You know, I, I, I look at my DJ status as like an honor code, to be honest with you, man, because it's like once you start on the road of just being a DJ, yeah, that's what you are. You know, it's it's about learning the equipment and learning the craft. And, you know, you, you pretty much focus on just being that. When you start DJing, if you're a real DJ, you not you're not too worried about what's on TV or what's or who's what or what. You you mostly worried about learning the equipment, learning what kind of cut was that he just did. Did he just do a double spin back? What was that? You know what I'm saying? It's like when cats are looking at shoes and fashion and stuff like that with their money. I'm looking at I'm looking at turntables and mixers and chords and you know stuff like that i djing is a lifestyle it's an art form it's a lifestyle it's a it's it's a lot of things not just it's more than just about the music what kind of equipment you got oh man you name it i got it you know it just depends on the venue and what i'm doing you know because like if i'm I DJ, 
I DJ in the studio. I DJ parties. I DJ concerts. So like, it just depends. Like I, people see me DJ on twelve hundreds. Then I got a Pioneer um, uh, board, and then I got like NS seven board. I got a, a CDJs. You know, it just depends on the mood and what the the action is. You know, sometimes you just like I use my CDJs with Serato if I'm not going to be on a, a a stable stage or if I got a small a little DJ booth and I bring out my Pioneer set. Or uh, if it's a concert and I'm in the middle of the stage and it's gonna be other DJs there and you never know. Somebody might try you, so you gotta have your weapons of mass destruction on deck. So <laughs> I just have to take care of myself and make sure that my reputation ain't at stake depending upon the equipment. You know what I'm saying? That's what a real DJ do. Uh, you gotta I- have everything you need. You know what I'm saying? You I got a whole closet full of stuff. Depending uh- on who called me, that's what I'm pulling out. You know what I'm saying? So I'll ask you, like, far as how would you say, how would you describe your your DJing style, and like, how do you like, what are some tips you use for like rocking the crowd and stuff? Uh, um, well, me personally, when it comes to uh, crowds, you know, I think the most important thing, if if you're not, you always gotta look your best first and foremost, just to show you don't just come to a, an event just to just to be a fly in the, on the wall you got to come to the event to be the event so you know whatever whatever it calls for like just say i'm doing an old school party i know i i gotta make sure that my equipment is clean that i'm super clean you know i'm gonna be shining you know it's it's all about making that appearance so the people automatically know oh this guy's here to rock this guy's gonna drop. He's gonna make it. He's gonna make me feel good. This is just off of what they see from from the visuals. Now, as far as the music go, I read the crowd. I have the different sets that I play for different uh, age groups, and depending upon which one is the more deepest in the crowd, then that depends on what I'm playing or, or how I'm rocking. But uh, you know, you got I got like about twenty thousand songs in my um. In my hard drive, so I'm pretty much prepared for anything, from rock and roll to soul. I can do a, a old school slow jam set and keep the dance floor packed. And I play 20 slow jams in a row, and nobody gonna sit down. You know what I'm saying? So it just depends on the the uh, the mood of the audience. Plus, I can really just make them do what I want them to do. I just have to see who's who and what's what. You know what I mean? And then what's your what's one of your uh, favorite songs right now? Uh, right now, yeah. Um, I'm jamming to uh, I like that uh, that uh, that Post Malone and uh, Twenty One Savage, mm-hmm. Rockstar. I love that song, man. That's a dope record. So how you feel and, about um, the new the new wave of rappers out now? 21 Savages, the Uzi Verts, the Yachty's, the Post Malone's. <laughs> yeah, I, I mean, I don't really consider Post Malone a rapper. I think he's more, he's like a the the their new version of 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 a Nate Dog or something. I don't know. I mean, because oh, he's saying he has his own thing. I, I just feel like the new generation is dope. Yeah, and and you know if you. If your mind is open to the culture, then you know that, and, and you know where we came from as far as in, in hip hop. You know, with the innovators and and the the, the style of clothes and, and the way that people um, change up the uh, the uh, the dialect for the regions. You know, you it don't it won't really bother you that much. You know what I'm saying? Like a lot of people get upset. Oh man. He looked like this and he looked like that. But if you go back and look at some of the O's, the yeah, look at Humpty the Hump. Hump. Yeah, you will see that same stuff, man. And um, you know, it don't bother it don't bother them like it didn't bother us. But well, the people that were older when we were looking at it, when we were coming up in in the game, you you feel me? 
So what do you think about the, uh, like, we have a lot of rappers, they don't really know the history of hip-hop, so what do you think about that? Yeah, well, you know, I don't really consider them cats, like, part of our actual culture. I mean, and they don't, I don't think they consider themselves part of our culture either. You know, like, just like when Yachty came out, you know, they gave him a hard time about him not knowing about Biggie and, and, and things like that of that nature, but... Hell, they they were big enough, Rich Homie Quan. He's the future of hip hop in Atlanta. And he didn't know about Biggie either. Yeah, he couldn't even rap right? that verse. He ain't got on stage and messed up the verse. So you know, it, it's it's like this, man. When you're dealing with people and, and, and uh, you can't put all this on nobody young because when you were young, you wasn't thinking about that. And a lot of these cats are making way more money than. Our um, peers that we were looking up to was making in them days. So, you know, their decisions and they, they they really clouded. You know, the world is different. So I just commend anybody who stepped out on a dream and made it happen. You know, and, and I don't criticize nobody and I don't try to judge nobody. If you're making good music and, and you got the formula down and you creating and it's, and it's funky and it's hot and it's dope. Then I'm gonna support it, you know. I'm gonna play it, and I I'm not into the politics of all that. All right, what current projects you working on right now? Oh uh, man, I just dropped a new mixtape yesterday. Actually, it's called um, "City of Sippers," and I know you're like, "What is that?" But what it is is the um, we got a whole new wave that just hit Atlanta, you know, and everybody is on the drinks. They're like, like you got to know that a lot of these rappers are, are promoting drugs and this, that, and the third, you know. But it's not really that, you know. They live in that life. They got that money. So, they, you know, they, they rapping about it. And I just made some music. Well, I didn't really make the music. I took the music to the level of where they're at and their consciousness. You know, like I slowed it down, kind of like the DJ Screw Vibe. But I did it for Atlanta. You know, we got a whole new wave of Atlanta artists that's here, you know, and they're, you know, they all sipping the syrup. So I just made a CD. And with that in mind, and, you know, the streets took to it yesterday like crazy. It was like I dropped it yesterday at 420 and, you know, before 6 o'clock, we was already at like 10,000 spins. Where you, put, where you put your mixtapes at? Like where you have uh, like, hosting sites? Uh, GetRightMusic.com, Spinnerilla, my mixtapes. Um, and uh, I'm working on my website, LegendaryDJBread.com, which that should be up before Christmas. So, yeah. Um, yeah, I was going to say, I noticed uh, I was reading like your name right now has LOD behind it. So what does LOD mean? Legion of Doom. Legion of Doom is the family. You know, um, I, if you're not familiar with us, I don't know where you be in, but Legion of Doom, we kind of was the blueprint of this whole DJ coalition thing from day one. You know, when we first got together back back in like 2000, it was, uh, it was some of the major OGs of this whole Dirty South movement. You know, we got DJ Funky, Kool-Aid, um, Greg Street was a part of, of Legion of Doom at one point, you know what I'm saying? Before they started Hitman DJs, which now they call themselves Coalition DJ. But you know, it was back in the day, we were young and we were just trying to organize, get organized so we could deal with these record labels and start getting the checks. And you know, it worked out, you know, and everybody's pretty much comfortable now, you know, because of the fact that. We all got organized and started um, running the DJ world like a business instead of just like a hobby. Hmm. So what do you mean by running it like a business? What are some things you did? Well, I mean, it's like a lot of times back in the days we were getting used by um, record labels, you know, because we were majorly the reason why they were popular. You know, the DJs were the reason why music was even being heard. Like, a lot of the stuff that was being played on the radio, they didn't even know about it until they heard us play it. So, you know, they were having these big promotional budgets put in line for for people to promote music. 
that whoever they were giving the money to wasn't they they weren't wasn't doing a good job of promoting because like we never knew about a, a, a promotional budget. We were just out here for the music. And you know, once we caught wind that other DJs were going to the record labels like, yeah, we broke this record and we know good and well that they got all their music off of our mixtapes, but they were going to labels collecting money off of the work that we were doing. You know, it was it was like maybe we need to go to the record labels and see if we can get some of that money because you know we just out here willy nilly having fun playing music, making sure that um we were the next, we were the hottest DJ. You know, it's nothing like being the guy that has the music first and is able to be the exclusive master of what what goes on in the city, you know, and the the OGs, we were the guys that were really the ones that were playing the music first. That's why we were called record breakers, because we were breaking the records and we were the trendsetters and as far as styles go and as far as, you know, just uh the whole forecast of what the the, the streets were going to be listening to as well we were bringing to the table and we weren't getting compensated for it but at that time it was just all about reputation it wasn't no uh instagram or facebook or it wasn't none of that stuff well, my space was barely brand new at that point when we were out there just bringing the music so we were the main source for all the music but the record labels had no clue that we existed that's why we even started labeling ourselves as the Legion of Doom because at that time it was only one other click and that was the Super Friends. And so, you know, we was the opposite of them. Name, <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Name some of the records that y'all broke. Oh, man. All of them, pretty oh. much. Everything that you heard from the South came from us. Like, we were DJ Funky. Who is like the CEO of of, of the uh, of the coalition DJ? His mixtapes were so dope. Like it was like he was in the uh, strip club. I think it was uh, Stokers. You know, and most of the time you had all these big rappers that were coming from New York that were coming down here. They, at that time, they weren't even big yet. They were just coming down here to use studios because you know Atlanta's full of studios at that time. So, you know, you might be in a strip club and then Fat Joe might walk up to you or Pharrell or anybody. Jay-Z might walk up to you and say, can you play this record? I just dropped this in the studio and I want to see how it sounds. And shoot, the nigga might give you the, a damn CD and $500. Pop that thing on and while it's playing, we record it. Put it on the CD. So now look, we got the exclusive. Hmm. But, like, it might be three or four months later, and it comes out on the radio. And they go straight to the top. But at that point, they wouldn't have knew if it was hot or not without the spin of DJ Funky or DJ Chap or DJ Hershey. You know, you had a Blue Flame. You had Gentleman's Club. JD's made, you know, he was famous for the Gentleman Club on Monday, you know. That Monday night was the night of all nights, every day, every every week for years and years. If you, if you wasn't in um, the Gentleman's Club on Monday night in Atlanta, you wasn't nowhere. That was like the Studio 54 of our of hip hop. So uh, the Gentleman's. I would say. So what? How how um how has it changed? Cause like you were saying earlier, he had Instagram, Twitter, and all that. Is it like you breaking records the same way, or is it like different way you break records now? I mean. Yeah, it, it's, it's way different. And not to mention, like, it's so many, um, like, it's a way that you can just fabricate everything that you do. You know, it's like, it's like a movie now. Everything is just like special effects. Like, in them days, you had to be exactly who you said you was. And, or you was going to get tested. How you going to test a dude on Instagram? You don't even know where he really is. He might not ever come out and do anything in real life. You feel me? Mm -hmm. 
Like a lot of those cats probably don't even have real DJ jobs. Their their job is by sitting behind their computer and playing records on a on a, on their um on the internet radio or something. Which I don't knock that, but you know you can make yourself be whatever you want to be on the in on the Instagram or on on the internet. But in real life, when you when you coming out. In those days, you had to have it. You had to have it. There was no, oh, let me do this over. Stop it. Let's rewind the tape and do it again so it's perfect. No, you had to be everything that you said you was. You had to know the ins and outs of the business. You had to make sure you got your money. You had to make sure you had the right equipment. All that. You can fabricate all that now. But in them days, there was no fabrication. But what, what has changed the game so much is it's so many outlets and platforms that you can put your music on where it can be broken. Like you can get heard and seen by a million people just like yesterday. It was over um ten thousand people listen to my mixtape in like six hours. Hmm. Did you have to put promotion <laughs> you know, behind it or you just dropped it? Or like how ways you promote your stuff? I mean, I, I really just promote my stuff on um, on my little social media spot because I'm like to, still to this day, I'm not a big social media guy, but you know, in my city, I'm well known, and um, you know, in in my surrounding area, so you know, I have a nice following when it comes to people that's just been dealing with me for a, a lot of years. So whenever I drop something, they're always on it. They're like, "Oh, Brad dropping a mixtape tomorrow." Oh, we're going to make sure we on deck. Because I always drop my mixtapes at 420. So, you know, if I say it's November the 4th at 420, they know at 420 to tune in. and Why you drop it, right why you it at 420, though? Because <laughs> you, know, <laughs> you know what time it is. 420, uh. you know what time 420 <laughs> is. Because, <laughs> you know, that's, you, know, you got to tune in. You got to get on that wave. Because... That's that's the kind of music I make right now. You know, that's what my head is. All right. And then what's the average day for you right now? What are some of your uh, daily habits and rituals? Oh, uh, man, like uh, I wake up in the morning I, I and I turn on my turntables. I like I, I practice every morning, probably like three hours. Then I, after that, I start working on beats. You know, I'm my, my life is right now is. All about the music, man. The music. The music, the music, the music. I wake up. I'm listening to what I did the day before. I'm working on mixtapes all day. I'm just chilling. You know, I got a couple of artists that I'm dealing with right now. And my whole thing is I got a new music um, style that I've been working on for years. You know, everybody who knows Brad knows I have a, a, a unique style and it's it's kind of slow and laid back. It's some real southern lazy stuff, but it's I call it slab music, and you know it's just it's uh, easy laid back going records, and and that's how my lifestyle is, man. I'm just easy going, laid back, chill, and I don't try to do too much stress, <laughs> too much stressing about nothing. You know what I'm saying? Just I'm just riding it out. We we done put in a lot of work over the years, so. Now here, it's time to just relax and just enjoy the fruits of our labor right now. That's what I'm all about. So what are some of your interests outside of music? Um, I'm an avid Falcons fan, and I like to bet on Madden. So. Yeah, sorry to hear that about the Falcons. They losing right now. I was just checking. Look, they losing again. They were winning, though. Man, really? Since I got on the phone, when I got on the phone, it was ten. Yeah, was let me ten. check. Yeah, they showing it right now. Yeah, let me uh, look. Yeah, it's like uh, let me look. Ten fourteen, Carolina. Oh my god! <laughs> I was say, so who you play with on Madden? Oh uh, no, nah, I don't play. My nephew plays, and he's the shit. So you know, I I just I bet with him. I don't think nobody can beat him. Well, you know the game. You know the game is supposed to be number one rapper in man. I mean, yeah, number one player in man in the world. So I don't think he could beat yeah. the game. Well, you know, if, if we ever cross paths with the game, you know, <laughs> I'm I'm a, I don't got much money. This game got, 
But you know, I take a little bit of his though. But that's actually why you he know? called a game. It's cause that's what he used to do, play the game all the time. <laughs> I didn't know that, but that's actually why he called a game because he used to play the game all the time. So shit, yeah, ain't that? So where you see yourself five years from now? Man, I see myself five years from now, hopefully in a bigger house, and uh, <laughs> just um with. With the, my new proteges and letting them enjoy the fruits of their labor, you know, and um, and me still looking for other um, extravagant talent, and hopefully we'll still be boosting up this hip hop culture and, and making it even bigger and better than what it is now. Because at one point it looked like it was about to be over for us, but I think it was just you know when it comes to that negative publicity, everybody always likes to draw to it and just. Yeah, it's over. It's, uh, they done messed when, everything when, up. When was that? When you was, when was that? What was that? When, where were we at when they were saying when we were saying that? When Nas was saying hip hop was dead. A lot of people were saying hip hop was oh. dead. Yeah, Nas. You know, and, and at the same time, you you can yeah. I, I don't think it was Nas' fault, but I think it, they were just mad because hip hop was in the south. But like now, you got people in the south. That are that are hating on the south. You but remember, you gotta Pimp C was saying we don't make hip hop in the south. He said we make country rap tunes. Yeah, well, you know, I love Pimp C. Uh, Pimp C's like my favorite rapper. And and, and and well, between Pimp C and Run from Run DMC, because Run is the person who made me love hip hop. Because I and and to find out that he was a DJ and he rapped, that was really what. More part of my inspiration to start DJing too was because he was a DJ. I wanted to be Run. <laughs> just I, Reverend Run, like if I ever get to meet Reverend Run, that'll be I can I can die a happy man. You know what I'm saying? But he's one of the reasons why I'm, I'm who I am. But yeah, I know Pimp C say a lot of stuff, man. <laughs> he said Atlanta in the South. When when he said that, he said Atlanta ain't the South. That was the East Coast. Yeah, I, I don't agree with everything Pimp C said, but you know, for the most part, I fuck with Pimp C and everything about him. And like, even when I rap, people people say, "But you sound like Pimp C." But I like, well, thank you, because he was the greatest of all time, coming from the south. So who your who your who your top five from the south? All south rappers top five. All time. Mm hmm. Oh man, you gonna make me have a headache. <laughs> oh. <laughs> Let me see here. I mean, of course, you know I gotta say Pimp C. You know, in um, three thousand, three thousand is one of the greats. You know, um, I I also gotta give it up for uh, yeah, and I also gotta say for um, uh, the number three man probably be Big Crit, and um, you know he. He was one of the ones that I felt like had plenty to say, and he said it perfectly every time. You know what I'm saying? And his records were just, like, even going back to his first mixtape, every song, he just was, he, he just an awesome dude, man. I love Big Crit. And what did I, did I say, 3,000? Yeah. I got two more. Two more, yep. Damn. Two more. Who, who else? I'm going to be upset when I get out this interview because I'm going to be done. left out somebody that's very influential. But I can't think right now, man. I, 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 let me think. Let me think, man. I would say, what about P, Lil Wayne, Scarface, A Ball, MJG? Oh, yeah, of course. You know, I got to say A Ball, MJG. They, they were, I was just on tour with them. Man, them they dope. Um, it's so many. You gotta say the top. Now I like Master P. I just felt like Master P production was what was what made me love No Limit so much. It was more the production that made me love No Limit more so than the the lyricists. It wasn't until I got to sit down and listen to Fiend and Mystical and all them that I felt like, as far as um lyrics was concerned, you know, rapping. What do you Master think about P Cash Money? 
Um, yeah, I'm gonna tell you. I'm gonna tell you since we was just talking. Uh, Scarface. Scarface is. I I feel like when I used to listen to Scarface, and that's um what albums was that like the Fix and you know um. It's a couple of his albums, and it's, he's got a song with, with uh, Nas. That song that he did with Nas, I can't think of the name of it right now. Mm-hmm. But that was one of the songs that was that made me really feel like, like shit, man, this this dude right here is, is incredible. I, I know for a, maybe like a whole month, I probably only listened to that song. <laughs> <laughs> you know what I'm saying? For a whole month. And you know, of, of course, you know, I, coming up, I listen to a lot of UGK. A what's, your lot favorite, of, what's your favorite UGK album? Um, uh, the uh, Sweet James Jones Diary. Hmm. Okay. What advice would you give to any new artists? Uh, my advice to new artists is don't follow them. Don't follow everybody else's trend. I, my advice is for you to just innovate your own style. Learn how shit is done and then innovate your own style as opposed to just copying what you think is hot just because you think that's what the standard is because that's the only way we're going to be able to push this thing to the next level and the next level and the next level and the next level, and the next level is by people taking a chance and doing trying to outdo what the next man did instead of just following the same blueprint as the next man all right what would you like to say to all your fans people that have been supporting your career uh just tell them i love them and thank you and you know i'm i'm one of the most approachable people on the planet you know what i'm saying so if you see me out somewhere just come up dap me up i mean back in the day when i was on rap city a lot of people were, um, used to walk up and take pictures and stuff. But, you know, a lot of that don't happen no more, you know. And I I think it, it got a lot to do with just people and, and egos and attitudes, you know. Everybody's supposed to be somebody in Atlanta. And, you know, they forget that it's certain people out here that had to lay it on the line for them to even be able to say that they do music. Because... And them days when we came up, you couldn't say you did music. Somebody else had to say it. Hmm. Well, I know you. You're the guy that, that, that you do music. You're a DJ or you look like it. You look the part. But everybody looks the part now because that's fashion. But it can't be on you. It's got to be in you. All right, man. I want to say thanks for coming through politics with me. Hey, man. No doubt, man. And anytime you're ready to talk, hit me up. I'll be right here, dog. Right. ATF. And what's right, your social media? Oh, for sure. DJ Brad ATL on on uh, Instagram and on my Twitter. And I'm always on my Twitter. I love Twitter, man. I love Twitter more than I love anything. And that's it's DJ Brad. Would you like Twitter. about Twitter? I, I just feel like Twitter is more business orientated. And people that hit me on my Twitter seem to have more sense. <laughs> they ain't hit me. They're not hitting me up trying to load up my load up my email full of records that they ain't gonna let nobody hear and want opinions about stuff. They're, they when you hit me on Twitter nine times out of ten, you already got a website or you got some way a link or something posted where I can listen to your stuff. I hate for people to send me hundred songs in my email. And I, you never sent it to nobody else. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? I like to organically find you. I don't want to be, you know what I'm saying, bombarded with a, a million artists that yeah. that are that just woke up this morning. Oh, that's Brad. Let me um, how did I find him and just blow me up? You know what I'm saying? Is there anything we didn't cover you like to talk about? Say what? Anything we didn't cover you like to talk about? Um, let me think. I don't know, man. I really wasn't, um, I was really just following your lead, be honest with you, man. And, um, I, uh, I probably should have been a little bit more prepared. But, yeah, I was working on that mixtape all night. 
and promoting and listening to it. And of course, it's a screw tape, so you know what I was on. So <laughs> I was done. Popolitikin.com. Listening to popolitikin.com, a self help meets hip hop brand. If you are an artist or business owner wanting to be featured on popolitikin.com, contact us at popolitikin at gmail.com. That's P O P O L I T I C K I N at gmail.com or text 760 717 5803. If you're a listener that enjoys the show and wants to support, you can donate to popolitikin.com via paypal.com. Please send donations to popolitikin at gmail.com. Any amount will be helpful in continuing to create quality content and shows. As always, check out popolitikin.com for past episodes. Make sure you subscribe to Popolitikin on iTunes, YouTube, Podomatic, Stitcher Radio, and Google Play.